Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Lobel, she was born and raised in New York City, and she lived there for most of her childhood. Uh, from a young age, she has been very interested in child development and how it can be impacted by developmental disabilities and also by trauma. Uh, she attended the New York University School of Medicine and then did her general psychiatry training at North Shore Zucker Hillside and Mount Sinai for her child and adolescent psychiatry training. Uh, she also took a year off in medical school to live and volunteer in Jerusalem. So that's that's fascinating someplace that I will go when everyone's traveling again, one of these days. Um, she has worked not only at the, in a university, she's currently at UTMB, but also in community, child mental health, and private practice. And that's one of the things that the CPAN program, one of the kind of unintended consequences is we have gotten a lot of um, people in private practice have been logging on. And then a lot of people from community mental health here in El Paso have been logging on to these educational sessions. So I get to I get to see you all and connect with you all. It's, it's terrific. I think our community is so much stronger because of this program in so many unintended ways. Uh, she, so Dr. going back to Dr. Lobel, uh, she's been at UTMB since September, 2014, uh, but she actually lives now in Tampa Bay, near Tampa Bay. And so she is a, a virtual faculty member. Maybe we should try to get some of those too. Then you can really have a, a wider pool of psychiatrists to choose from. Because we are always looking for child psychiatrists, either full or part-time, if you know anybody. <laughs> so good afternoon. Um, this is uh, CPAN Grand Rounds, the impact of early life trauma and how we can respond. Um, and as do you may know CPAN is a Child Psychiatry Access Network. So the objectives today are to recognize how early life trauma may present to us in clinic and to become aware of the treatment options for children who've been impacted by these traumas. So I thought it was important to define what is trauma. Um, it seems to mean different things to different people. Uh, according to our main diagnostic manual, it is actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. That can be a direct experience through witnessing it happen to someone else, through learning it uh, occurred to someone with whom you're close, in which case it would have been a violent or accidental situation, uh, through repeated ex or extreme exposure to aversive details in the older population, above age six. I mean, it has to be more in person if you're under age six. I found this interesting quote that says the range of events that young children may experience as traumatic is potentially broadened by the natural limitations in a young child's capacity for self-protection. So the child cannot keep themselves safe from these traumas um, or get themselves out of these situations in the same way that an older person may be able to do it. So there is what are considered adverse childhood experiences or ACEs that people have been talking about the past few years. Um, they are potentially traumatic events that occur in a child's life, not necessarily just ones that fit that DSM diagnosis of, or definition of trauma. They include physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, parental substance abuse, mental illness, suicide or death of someone else in the family, crime or imprisonment within the family, uh, and other things, and that can cause lifelong medical, mental, and social suffering. Oops, too far. <laughs> there is an important study that was done in 2016, which is the CDC Adverse Childhood Experiences, ACEs study. They found a statistically significant and dose-dependent connection among categories of the childhood adversity. So the um, categories are the maltreatment category where the child is treated badly themselves or the dysfunctional household category where with, you're within a home where there is dysfunction, like the parent has some sort of um, illness or substance abuse or the parent can't is incarcerated or needs to leave. Um, they found this correlation with the more adverse childhood experiences you have, the worse impairment, the worse uh, risks the person takes, the worse um, 
outcomes in terms of disease and disability and social problems, and the more likely they are to die of to die early. They can't determine causation, but this is an important association for us to be aware. Complex trauma is something that happens that involves multiple ACEs essentially, and that's something that one could expect to, I guess, be a little more common. Um, I mean, not more common, sorry, that, that a little more uh, dramatic. Um, children, people who have multiple or prolonged early life trauma, um, and that can be considered complex trauma. And it's mainly within the child's immediate caregiving system. Again, the child can't just leave, go find another caregiving system. Um, the chronic and complex trauma tends to have a more pervasive effect on the brain development. And it's not clear whether that's ever um, changes back. More traumas to a worse outcome, or so it seems. On the other hand, a more isolated trauma tends to lead to a more conditioned response. So I want to talk a little bit about the extent of the problem, why it's important to talk about this. Over Every year, over 3 million kids in the U.S. are reported as having been abused and or neglected. And about a million of those reports actually have evidence, so about a third. And about 1,500 children die per year at the hands of caregivers. Um, and that can be from abuse and neglect. What kinds of effects is the trauma having on the, this developing brain and this developing body? Um, there's, what's been found is an altered epigenetic gene translation. So um, we have our genes that we're born with, but then they get translated, so to speak, into um, what we see in the person and to how the person is uh, the, the, what's called a phenotype. Um, and it can, these genes are read differently, so to speak, based in part on trauma. Um, there is, let's see, I just want to see that one. okay, there's also been found to be an altered immune response in people who have had this, uh, had these traumas. What's happening on the nervous system? So there is the dopamine pathway, which I showed kind of in the top left corner, and that appears to play an important role centrally. Um, you, there is an increased reactivity of the dopamine in response to stress that's associated with these ACEs. So you just have some reactivity, but it gets even more reactive if you. Um, more reactive in response to stress in a person who's had one or more of these um, adverse childhood events. The trauma alters the connections, the connectivity within the HPA axis and the responses of the limbic system. So that has to do with emotion regulation, mood, that sort of thing, and affects serotonin, which is important for mood and anxiety. And again, it's not clear how reversible or how long these effects will be. Okay, I forgot how to make it move forward for a minute. So um, autonomic is part of the nervous system that has to do with um, like the fight or flight response, for example. Early life trauma is associated with the HPA axis. I mentioned a lot of the, it getting dysregulated. Though there's been conflicting results on the effect of cortisol. Uh, sorry, effect on cortisol rather, which is one stress hormone of, uh, what's considered a stress hormone. Some find that the, with a more active HPA axis, you get more cortisol, some, yeah, sorry, some find increased, H, increased of the HPA activity, maybe more cortisol, some find decreased and maybe less, but essentially what we need, it doesn't seem to be reacting as it should be. Lower cortisol may lead to a more like blunted affect, not reacting as much, which could then affect the next generation because if you have a mom with this blunted affect, it's going to interfere with the bonding. Um, PTSD is associated with things like elevated catecholamines. And so then you'll have an increased sympathetic arousal. 
um, epinephrine, another thing that you, uh, another um, chemical that relates to stress, um, has been found to um, to if it, it um, to impact the, the development of post traumatic stress disorder symptoms, and there is a the precursor of norepinephrine, which is another chemical that relates to um, anxiety and, and mood um, that has been found to um, increase more in the saliva in people who've had early, uh, earlier childhood trauma. And you tend to have higher stress on the time of trauma and more post-traumatic stress disorder if that salivary metabolite remains high. Now what about some of the psychological effects of the trauma, the ones that aren't necessarily so clearly medical? Um, the child who's going through this trauma is learning how to survive and adapt short term. And this works, it keeps them alive, it gets them through this short term trauma, but it can be maladaptive in the long term. And that can become confusing and concerning for healthcare workers and parents or caretakers who then take have these children later and don't understand what's going on and then will react to the way the child is behaving, leading to further problems and the child can get more stigmatized. Um, children who've undergone a lot of trauma have a have trouble figuring out like cause and effect. You know, did they cause the problem to happen, especially a kid who may have magical thinking? And so that is very important developmentally, and then they don't have that so well, and that's a problem. And they also will tend to have poor self-esteem because there's a lot of guilt. And some additional effects, the um, ACEs interfere with uh, developing relationships. These children and then adults tend to struggle socially in school and with medical problems. Um, with those problems, the medical, social, and legal problems, that they wind up needing more services. Um, they're more likely to have some of these serious outcomes like psychosis, coronary disease, diabetes, cancer even. Um, like I said, there seems to be an effect on the immune system and the immune systems developing just like everything else in early childhood. And also over time, there's this cycle of violence. It can essentially go to the next generation that um, the child grows up with this heightened um, reactivity and then is going to respond to their children in a similar way or in patterns that they learned that are not so helpful and continue that problem to the next generation. How does the early life trauma affect bonding and attachment? Well, the more typical bonding as defined in the 1940s by uh, Balby, it uh, um, defines um, attachment as specific to one person or a few people, lasts throughout most of your life and involves many of the most intense emotions, this intense love. It's very difficult to abandon early attachment figures. So this can be a problem if the attachment figure leaves for whatever reason on purpose or through death or incarceration or something, um, or if you're taken away because that attachment figure was a problem for you, it's hard for the child to see it that way. Um, and an infant will seek out the primary caregiver in response to perceived danger, even sometimes if that primary caregiver is the danger. If the child loses a primary caregiver, then there's nowhere for them to go. Um, and if the caregiver is the one who abused or neglected the child, then the child's going to learn, like, they, this is their primary person to trust, so there is no one to trust. And that is, again, it's a cycle. They go to get adopted or fostered or somewhere to another family, and the new caregivers, there's this assumption that uh, essentially that the new caregivers are going to do the same. And so then when they feel threatened, they can't go to the new caregivers either because they feel um, that they feel like they're, they can't trust and they feel like they're not worthy of 
having a relationship, a positive relationship. Um, so it's this baggage ascension that's brought to the new relationship. Different parenting techniques can be associated with worse outcomes. Um, and these uh, essentially will often lead to more externalizing behaviors like uh, acting out, hurting other kids so or, or adults or animals. Um, so I just wanted to, it, should I be looking at the comments, by the way, to see if there's anything to answer as I go along or? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you if there's any questions. Okay, got it. I just wasn't sure. Um, yeah, you so, focus on the, on the okay. presentation so and I'll interrupt if I need to. Okay, so things like being too punitive or um, maybe the being a little too lax, it helps since to have a more positive parenting, work on problem solving. Um, so if you see a child in the office who is having these problems, that there are parenting techniques like here that you recommend against if you're seeing them, but instead you recommend something that's more consistent, supervising, positive, um, and working on problem solving. This, I, I include this list of maladaptive behaviors in response to trauma, it's huge. Um, and I include it because if you look at them, a number of them are gonna be found in any kid um, or kind of most of them are gonna be found in kids who aren't necessarily or haven't necessarily experienced a trauma. Um, it's not necessarily like, oh, okay, they have two or three of these, so that means that they've been exposed to trauma. But these, but when a child who's been exposed to trauma is presenting with these behaviors, then you are, these are, uh, tend to be because they're, that's the way that worked for them to deal with the trauma in the moment, but it's not going to work long term. Um, I recommend that you ask about trauma because you might not know. There are some screens available. Um, I don't know that any are widely used, um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know of any that are widely used, but you could always also refer to it. Oh, not refer to, but contact CPAN with, for uh, further questions. The way that post-traumatic stress disorder is diagnosed. Okay. Well, first, of course, there's the exposure to the trauma. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. There's the post this is me. Sorry. Um, I don't know yeah, why I'm talking from the, the past and I don't know how to fix that, but mm -hmm. I'm going to hit escape and I see what I did here. Okay. And turn that off. Um, I am so sorry about that. Hopefully there isn't any more of that. Um, no problem. I think I copied this from an earlier lecture that was not live. Uh, so that's what happened. Okay. So I was wondering why I was taught, uh, who that person was. Um, so how do I do this? I got to move this away from current slide. Okay. So of course, to diagnose post-traumatic stress disorder, as I was saying, um, is you've had an exposure to trauma. Um, and that's defined before. And then there are symptoms that develop after the, it, it either develop after or worsen in response to the trauma. So you have to recognize, you know, was this always going on or is this something just happening now or is that is worse now? Um, and that includes things like nightmares, um, memories that in a child can be play, how they're playing, they're bringing it up and play a lot, or they can be asking questions over and over again. And in the younger child, they might not appear upset. They're just bringing up these things or playing these games and not putting it together. And when they do have a nightmare, they may not, re or even we may not recognize that the nightmare has anything to do with what they went through. Um, they may dissociate or act like it's happening again. They're going to get upset or even physically react to um, trauma or sorry, to reminders of trauma is what I meant to say. Um, the next part is there's this avoidance of things that remind you of the trauma. And then there's also cognitive and mood changes. Um, 
Under age six, you might have just the avoidance or just these cognitive mood changes. Um, the cognitive or mood changes include trouble remembering, but again, you have to consider, were they too young to remember? So that's not necessarily a diagnostic, doesn't work necessarily if they're very young. Um, uh, do they have a, um, they may have blame, blaming other people, um, a negative emotional state, um, and that can be any age really. Um, I meant to say that in terms of the avoidance that the younger kids don't tend to may not be avoiding so much things like uh, memories. It's something more concrete, a place, an item, things like that. But um, yeah, and over age six, it, there's more things that they may avoid or more kinds of things they may avoid. Um, when we're seeing a child who has uh, who can't remember in, and were, was old enough to remember, we have to distinguish that from they can't remember because they also got a concussion at that time or they've been using drugs or anything else like that that may be causing it. Um, changes in thoughts or mood uh, could be like more of a dampened positive emotional response in kids under age six. So they're not as likely to be unhappy all the time. It's harder to, to stay that when they're, way when they're younger, but um, they may not get as happy or as excited about things. Um, and some of the things that they may not be able to do or, or enjoy as much anymore, are things like play, because that's more of a significant activity for a small child as opposed to schoolwork or, or a job. Um, Another important criteria is the is sorry is arousal and reactivity. You can have tantrums essentially um, that are above and beyond what you might expect. Can get physical, physically aggressive. Um, there's hypervigilance, an increased startle, trouble sleeping and focusing. Um, and for the duration, I just include that because technically, if it's under a month, it's and over three days, it's called acute stress disorder. Um, and like with most of our conditions, this ha these problems have to cause significant distress or impairment. And in the smaller children, it often it doesn't necessarily cause significant distress or impairment to the child themselves, but it may affect the family or the caregivers. Additional information. So there's this book called the DC zero to five, which is a diagnostic manual for the younger kids. Um, and it includes some other diagnoses that haven't necessarily been um, accepted by DSM at this point. Um, and uh, some additional information they include is that this, like I said, that these, uh, that the caregiver can be affected or also that the accommodations that the caregiver's making can be what's affecting the family. Like if the child absolutely refuses to ever wear that shirt that they were wearing the day that, that their mom died, um, I mean, that's probably not overly a problem, but if, or if they refuse to go to a school, to go to a certain location, and the parent says, okay, well, I'll just homeschool you. Well, that's a big change. Is this interfering though, or is it not? That, those are questions. And be careful about diagnosing this in the child is too young. Like under a year certainly can be hard. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever had enough information to say that it's under a year it, it can diagnose that. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder in abused children in particular. So some children have these cyclical patterns with periods of increased reactivity and then they're more numb and restricted. Um, so this is also very confusing for the caregivers that you're seeing them sometimes just really agitated and getting upset at the drop of a hat and other times they're just numb and they aren't reacting to anything. Um, abused children, like I said before, but with this uh, trouble interpersonally, um, emotional regulation is a big issue as well. Kids who've been abused, um, they have trouble de-escalating when they do get upset. So that's something else to be aware of, um, that we are, they, these are the kids who get in trouble because they threw a desk at school. That, that can be the reason that they're so uh, dysregulated and didn't calm down when another child might have. 
may be causing it. Um, the differential diagnosis is Oh, no, it did it again. Consider. Okay. Um, so, oh, there it is. Um, the differential diagnosis, like I was saying again, I'm so sorry. I thought I had gone through and fixed this. Um, I think that it's important to consider when the symptoms started uh, or worsened um, to see if it's related to trauma before you decide on the diagnosis more certainly. Um, in, if it's in the context of a death, it could be bereavement, it could be an adjustment disorder. Um, I wrote attachment disorders, but even though disinhibited social engagement disorder is an attachment disorder, I don't feel like it resembles PTSD nearly as much. Um, the attachment disorders, a lot of times since things happen so early in the life, we may never know what the trauma or the trigger was. Um, reactive, I'll talk a little more about reactive, the, the different attachment disorders later. Um, dissociative disorder is such a just, is more just the dissociation and not as much of, or, or not really the other symptoms as much from PTSD. Um, ADHD and disruptive impulse control and conduct disorder uh, diagnoses can really resemble PTSD because you have the inattention. They can't have trouble calming down to go to sleep at night in ADHD. Um, they are not staying still. They're reactive. And the disruptive impulse control and conduct disorder, they're reactive. They're striking out. They're having these tantrums. Um, they're agitated. And so to distinguish are they just, uh, is this related to an untreated or undertreated ADHD or are they all ramped up because of something terrible that happened to them? Those are important things to be aware of. Um, and I mentioned personality disorder, that's more in older kids. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the attachment disorders. Um, so one of the attachment disorders is reactive attachment disorder. And I define them more based on the early childhood manual rather than a DSM. So with reactive attachment disorder, there's this lack of an attachment to any caregiving adult. Um, they tend to be withdrawn, inhibited. They don't, they're not so interested in other people, not going out for comfort when they're upset. Um, they can appear almost autistic because of this lack of reciprocity and they do tend to have this emotion regulation difficulty like you'll see in PTSD. And this tends to be from things like neglect, um, which can also be associated with, uh, with PTSD, so, or with um, other problems later in life. Um, and in the DSM, they focus more on the cause, but it, again, we often don't necessarily know that if this child is, let's say, adopted or, um, came to this caregiver without much history. Disinhibited social engagement disorder is another kind of attachment disorder. Again, I don't, I wouldn't really expect to mix that up with post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of what it appears like, um, but it is again, something that can happen due to this lack of an attachment figure. Um, and that's in the picture, it's a kid essentially about ready to go off with the stranger for a lollipop because they're willing to go off with, you know, any adults and they're intruding and wandering away. There's a proposed diagnosis that's the developmental trauma disorder because there is an overlap between post-traumatic stress disorder and attachment disorders. Um, the children who develop post-traumatic, the children who've been exposed to trauma, often they've also been neglected and they're they could develop PTSD, they could develop attachment disorders, they could develop both, uh, but there's a lack of research on this. Uh, for young, um, those who've had more complex interpersonal trauma are thought to be at risk for the developmental trauma disorder diagnosis. We could come up with that. Um, they tend to have this dysregulation and it impacts bonding, which I had said before, bonding is very important. Um, attachment has been seen to affect the response to trauma. So if the person you're attached to, if you're an infant and the person you're attached to is the one who is in danger or 
in fact, is gone, um, you're more you're likely to have more severe PTSD symptoms, especially if it's like intimate partner violence and someone else who's supposed to have been there for you. Um, and the other reason for this developmental trauma disorder possible diagnosis is that PTSD might not ca capture the complexity of trauma. Uh, so, and Dr. Lovell, uh, this is Dr. Martin again. Um, we yes. have a question from the audience. What is the I did it again. Uh -huh. Uh, sorry, what's the question for the audience? Uh, okay, so the question is from uh, Dr. Schwartz, uh, and he is asking, uh, or he's mentioning that uh, sociopathic personalities are extremely hard to diagnose or work with. Is there any indication that early childhood trauma could have an effect on these people or in any way be associated with causality? Are there any therapies that could be useful? Um, so yeah, I would say that early childhood trauma can can make you more likely to have that sociopathic kind of development um, personality. And we try to deal with it. Um, I'd say it depends on what symptoms you're seeing at the time and also later. Um, for younger kids, I'm if it's, if it's very clearly that they're still focused on the trauma or there is trauma, then there are these therapies I just, I have here. Um, if it's not so clear that it's from a trauma, you can do something like parent-child interaction therapy. It doesn't have to be a biological parent, but um, whoever is the new caretaker to work on a more positive strategy, a rewarding the good behavior, um, when to do timeouts, how to do timeouts. Um, once someone's reached adulthood, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy has been found to be more helpful, um, so that they're more aware of like how they're feeling. And unfortunately, a lot of times you have to kind of focus on, okay, this is going to get you into trouble as opposed to, because they don't have that relationship, um, that, that was really hindered the ability to form a relationship, uh, um, that bond was impacted so early on and they may have trouble seeing it as, well, you want to fit within society. You want to be loving and, and meet someone who loves you and who you love in the same way. Um, there's a difference with that because of the problems with bonding early on. Does that answer your question? I don't one hear thing, you. Um, one thing I, uh, he just typed the question in, so I don't know. Oh, okay, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if he can answer, but uh, he can always answer in the chat. And then also, um, you know, uh, she's like Dr. Lobel said, these therapies are what you really need to focus on because there are yeah. not good medications for this. Um, but, and it, and these therapies are sometimes very specialized, but that's one way that, oh, he said, yes, that answered very well. Okay, good. Um, thank you. And one way to access all these therapies though, is to call CPAN because they will know who is, is doing either yeah. virtual therapy or, yeah. um, or some, somebody that is providing that kind of therapy within your community. So right. almost all the places in El Paso that do these sorts of therapies are doing virtual. So even if your patient is in Marfa, they can still have access. Yeah. And that's a good thing that's happening nowadays that there's a lot of uh, virtual therapies. So that allows you, if you're in an area without as many therapists around to get treatment, hopefully. Um, the, the gold standard for treatment is therapy, like she was saying, not medication. Um, so... Um, in the older kids, it tends to be trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. In the younger kids, it's child-parent psychotherapy, but there's a bit of an overlap. Child-parent psychotherapy hasn't been overly well studied in the very young kids under three, but um, in the if, it, if you're more immature, um, you might want to, that child may need the child-parent psychotherapy um, and on the other hand, if a three to six year old, let's say is they're three to six, but they're more sexualized or they have a lot more in terms of the internalizing or externalizing problems, you might do the trauma focused CBT. Um, and there is a specific preschool one at this point. Contraindications to doing the therapy, even though usually that's what I would recommend is 
if there's another condition that needs acute stabilization. So if the child is suicidal and they need to be admitted or um, psychotic and we need to get them back to reality, things like that um, mean that they can't wait and go through therapy. Um, also, if the therapy is in a group, the child, you have to think about the child. Can they handle being in a group? Are they too dysregulated, too hyper, too inattentive to sit for the course of a group? And if only for financial reasons, a lot of times, oh, while when I trained in, tra in trauma-focused CBT, I learned about it as like a one-on-one -on -one kind of therapy. A lot of times it may wind up being multiple because, uh, I mean, group, just financially, that's what makes sense. Education is an important part of all treatments. It's important to educate the new caregivers so that they're more realistic, because especially because a lot of times they just don't know the background of the children coming to them. It can help for the caregivers to understand why their ch the children may be behaving as they are. Again, we often don't know for sure because a lot of times the uh, history isn't provided. Um, and it can help with the caregivers' reactions to the children, um, which, like I said before, can lead to worsening behavior of the child, worsening self-esteem, worsening attachment. Um, and the kids do tend to challenge these parents and can help the parent to get the, or caregiver to get their own help and to learn to regulate their own emotions. The, the caregiver is the adult. So they're the one who has to learn to adjust. The child's going to have to too, but the, uh, ultimately in life, <laughs> but the caregiver is the mature adult and they have to be the one who's stepping in and providing the structure. Reactivity that's seen in the child is not it, it generally does not resolve until the trauma is resolved um, or at least dealt with. Child parent psychotherapy, I just want to give people a sense of what that was um, because I mentioned that as something that might be helpful for our kids. It's psychodynamic. It's good for the younger ones. Um, a lot of it's working on the parents, the parents learning to uh, read cues, read the children's behaviors, understand their own behaviors and how that's affecting the child, um, learning how their own past experiences may influence how they're reacting to their child. That maybe they're getting upset because their kid reminds them of their dad or of something else that happened or what they went through. Um, and this, so by essentially making the parent a better parent or caregiver a better parent, it's going to help the child. For trauma, you can specialize it, uh, make things more specific, um, the more realistic response to the trauma, work on getting a more regular level of affect arousal for the parent and therefore for the child or the caregiver in there for the child. Rebuild this ability to trust um, and, and have these close relationships between the child and the parent. Um, help the family differentiate between the child reliving the trauma and just remembering it, thinking about it um, and putting the trauma into perspective. So that hopefully the child can get back to more regular development, so to speak. Trauma focused CBT is um, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, again, you've got the education at the start and they work on uh, behavioral strategies, stress management, um, calming down cognitive strategies, um, arguing against the thoughts you might have. They work a lot with the parents. Um, that's why this is specific to children. Um, and one of the central parts of trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is the trauma narrative. And I've found that kids may be resistant to therapy um, once they find out, uh, if only because they're concerned about a trauma narrative, or even if they don't know, a lot of times they don't know that's what's going to be part of it. But the idea of having to talk about the trauma. Um, and the way I describe it is, or, or explain it to them, is that the goal is for you to control the trauma and the memories of the trauma, rather than them controlling you. So you the, the child is coming to me and they can't, con they can't help but think about this stuff that happened to them. They can't help but have these nightmares. They're asleep. And so now they're trying to help by keeping themselves up all night, let's say. But once you've put the trauma into a story, you start 
then working with it to get more in control. One thing, that, another thing that may be helpful to know, but I might leave this to the therapist to inform the, um, I'm not sure, well, that it, it might be a little too much to say all at once. Once the, when the child is going through some of these things, like the trauma narrative, a lot of times things get better before they get worse. The child um, gets more out of control. However, hopefully they've learned these stress management techniques and the affect expression, cognitive coping, so that now when they're having these memories come up, they can deal with them a lot better than in the past. And the parent, the therapist has been working with the parent to do this as well. I mentioned parent-child interaction therapy before for um, the kids who have major behavioral problems. And this is something where the, the child essentially, you build the child up, the child directs play, child learns that they're important, but you also uh, teach the parent how to structure things as well. Uh, again, that's not the pediatrician's responsibility, that's more what you're referring them to. So. This is helpful, for example, in ADHD, but it can also be helpful in PTSD sometimes. Um, parent management training can be helpful in kids like with ADHD or behavioral problems. And this is to interrupt essentially the dysfunctional responses the parents are having that lead to worse behaviors. Um, so this is another thing you might refer a parent to and to help with the child and maladaptive behavior, and this is more focused on the parent. There have been um, ideas about intervening early, like if the child's had a trauma, and you go and they come to your office and, okay, what can I do right now before they meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD? So child and family traumatic stress intervention is something that has does have some data, but there's something called critical incident stress debriefing that does not. So I would not go with that one. It just, there's a lack of evidence. Um, what about adjustment in parenting? These are, these are important things to be aware of. Um, the, I describe it as symptoms of the child essentially in response. So this, a symptom may be that a child's going to respond quicker and more forcefully than another child would to a perceived threat because that's what they had to do to survive. And they may misread cues as threats because again, they had to always be on their toes. So the parent can help the child to understand when the things are not threatening and to use a more calming tone. It's important for the parent, or I keep calling him parent, but the caregiver, whoever that may be, to avoid verbal or physical aggression that's only going to reinforce this perceived threat. Um, the child may start to escalate behavior if they're not redirected because the fight or flight is so intense. So again, the, parent, the caregiver needs to lower their voice, their, uh, their tone, their intensity, come eye to eye, hold hands, reassure the child, use simple words the child can understand, and let the child know that it's okay to feel that way and to show that way, but not to hurt anyone. The child is a child and might not have the vocabulary for how they're feeling. You just give that vocabulary. The child may lack self-regulating ability and the calming skills. And that's often a problem with PTSD. So you can work to develop, the, the caregiver can develop relaxation strategies, figure out what works. And then initially the parent does it with them. Okay, let's do some deep breathing. And as time goes by, then hopefully the child can do it without the parent doing it. Um, and positive reinforcement, even for just trying to use the strategies and trying to express themselves. Say, that's great, I'm glad you tried. I'm glad you didn't throw a chair this time. Um, these kids often will challenge their caretakers. They're essentially recreating these uh, relationships that they're used to. So it's important for the parent, the caretaker to know, don't take it personally. It's not about you, it, they're living through or they're, they're working through what they, uh, what's traumatized them. So, and the, adult needs to be giving the child the message that they're safe, they're wanted now, they're, they're able and they're worthwhile, they're important. And you, the caregiver or whoever the caregiver is, they're avail I'm available, I'm reliable, I I'm going to listen to you. Um, and like I said, praising the neutral behavior, um, trying to stay calm, unemotional, and, and just these are things that uh, uh, 
pediatrician or someone can go over with a parent in their office who's like, I just don't know what to do while I'm waiting for therapy to start. Um, role of medication, because I know a lot of times people want to know about that. Like I said, and like we said, uh, we said before, the, it's not the first line usually. Usually if we're going to use it, it's more to treat uh, comorbidities um, uh, or if therapy is just not available, which happens sometimes, unfortunately. Um, Prezosin, it tends to be a medicine that I use if I'm going to use one for um, for post-traumatic stress disorder. It's good for nightmares. It was found to help them in um, people, soldiers who'd been in battle. Um, it improves sleep and that will hopefully then improve daytime functioning. Um, you start at one milligram. I've seen people start higher and, and I've seen then kids have reactions and not, or side effects and not want to continue. Um, you can increase every few days. Um, theoretically, it, up to date is to go up to five milligrams or more. I don't usually go that high though. Um, and certainly with the younger kids, I tend to go slower and lower. Um, and there's no evidence of a dose response relationship, at least not in pediatrics. Um, there's unfortunately also a lack of randomized control trials for the medications in general. Um, side effects that you see are things like low blood pressure, the you know dizziness, that sort of thing. Um, and usually a good way to deal with that is to make the med give the medicine a little bit earlier at night, because then if you have the side effects, you're kind of asleep when they happen. So if the blood pressure goes down a bit, you're asleep and you don't notice it. Um, guanfacine is often given for ADHD. I like that one for ADHD. So sometimes I'll give it in a kid who has ADHD and post-traumatic stress disorder. There's some that may help, um, less evidence for that. Um, and I tend to start with one milligram again in the evening and, and can increase by one milligram until it's effective. There's a maximum of 0 0.08 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, so previously we just did like one to four milligrams and that was it, four was done. But there's been studies, at least for ADHD, showing that it can actually be weight-based. Um, and that some, and I have seen that some kids need that higher dose, at least for the ADHD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, I'm not so sure how well it's helping with that versus ADHD. Um, Dr. Blabel, there's a couple yes. of questions about this topic um, yes, okay. that you're discussing right now. Um, let's see, uh, Dr. Alvarado uh, is talking about ADHD, how it's in the differential um, mm -hmm. and how uh, the smaller prefrontal cortex and abused children and the orbital frontal cortex reduce mm -hmm. volume. So in that, how that's similar to ADHD. So her question is when, mm -hmm. When would you add the second diagnosis of ADHD rather than attributing any symptoms to PTSD and trauma history? And then there's another question after that too, when you're done with that one. Uh, usually what I consider, uh, I'll do an ADHD um, diagnosis if I think that the problem was going on before the trauma, that I mean, the symptoms are happening even before the trauma. Um, so they weren't due to the trauma. Um, but that get, can get tricky, especially in a very young child where there wasn't time, you know, you, they weren't in school or a toddler is hype, <laughs> is running around and right. isn't sitting still and paying attention. So you might not know. Um, sometimes I have had, I did have one mom who, or grandma who was very, who, who really knew a lot. And she was able to say this kid, even before was more hyper than other toddlers was more, uh, you know, inattentive than other toddlers. So I said, okay, in addition to PTSD, they have ADHD. Um, and also just sometimes, I guess, from a more practical standpoint, if the PTSD treatment is, is, being, uh, is being used and it's still just not helping enough, we might add in an ADHD medicine or might change an ADHD medicine. Great. And then um, there was another question. Um, is, is ciproheptadine ever useful? Um, so I've seen people argue for ciproheptadine. Um, I don't, I think there's a lack of evidence for that, if I remember correctly. Um, it's, I think there's just, there's been very little in terms of, of studies showing that that's helpful. Um, 
And I don't know whether the reason it helps is it helps him sleep. Um, but again, and I don't, and I also don't know whether it's just a lack of studies also that is why it hasn't been shown. I know that a lot of times people will use, and I have it here, either an antidepressant or an antipsychotic or anticonvulsant too, like Depakote I've seen. Um, the antidepressants, um, sertraline is, has an indication in adults for PTSD. It has not been found in studies to help the kids. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't help them. It just, or sorry, it, it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't help in some kids, but um, it's not as helpful uh, for straight PTSD. Um, so if someone also happens to have major depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder, I try sertraline or if, or another SSRI, or if they've tried these medicines and the sites, things like prazosin and therapy and all of that, and they're still having a lot of anxiety that even though it seems to be due to the PTSD, sometimes I'll try an SSRI. Um, the second generation antipsychotics and the anticonvulsants, the results are very mixed and they're it's limited um, and they're, they have the side effects. So that's a big issue for them, um, the obesity, uh, metabolic side effects. Propranolol does seem to lead to reduction. Um, there was an idea that maybe it would prevent the development of PTSD, but it, that hasn't seemed to hold up so far. Um, okay, I thought I had a lot more and I was trying to rush through. Um, so thank you for listening. And I know I especially rushed through toward the end because I was going too slow at the beginning. Um, so if you have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, CPAN is here to help you uh, serve the, your pediatric patients, um, primary care Providers can call that number 1-888-901-CPAN um, from 8 to 5. I think they've changed. It was 4.30, but now it's 5. And I just realized that's wrong. Um, but the rest of it should be right. Um, yes. Yes. And we have the same number for all of Texas. So yes. And then you, know, you can just put in there Texas Tech. If, if you're from this area, it's Texas Tech El Paso. If you're from, you know, whatever medical school you're closest to, that's who you're going to be um, assigned to and who the actual psychiatrist that you'll talk to. And I've called once or twice just to kind of experiment. And I don't actually, when I've called, I haven't had the option to press a number. I just talk to someone directly. So um, I guess you would probably just say, this is where I'm working. And it's supposed to be, uh, it's geographic location. And I think it's zip. No, I always get it wrong. But it's, you know, it's, they, they just ask. updated. They just updated the system. So uh, it's, I'm not sure what you press if it's for UTMB, but mm -hmm. basically Texas is uh, split up into all different regions. And if it's El Paso you're trying to get to, then you press uh, four for the West region and um, two for Texas Tech El Paso. Cause also in the West region, of course, is Texas loving. And so I think it's going to be Eastern region for UTMB or maybe South. I think it's South and Southeast. I think we're Southeast or South until, uh, yeah, I don't remember. So um, anyway, it leads you through it. So wherever, that. yeah, wherever you are, push some buttons. And if you go to the wrong one, then they'll probably answer your medical question. But then if it's a question having to do with what type of services near yeah. your patient, then they'll transfer you. Yeah. 